Welcome to Bio 6612. Today I'm going to talk about Intro to Generalized Linear Models, Part 1. In today's lecture, we're going to cover types of outcomes, uh, a brief review of linear regression, and look at where linear regression fails. There are optional readings for this lecture in the Dobson and Burnett textbook in Chapter 3. So outcome variables or responses can be numeric or categorical. Numeric responses take on values that are numbers. Uh, and numeric responses can be either continuous or discrete. Continuous numeric responses are not restricted to specific values. They can take on any value in a given range, and some examples include weight and blood pressure, whereas discrete responses can only take on specific particular values. Um, for example, number, number of deaths, which would be an integer response. Categorical responses, on the other hand, are non-numeric, these are categories. And they can be nominal. Um, for example, blood type, where you can have blood type A, blood type B, um, gender, male versus female. Or they can be ordinal, which are categorical responses that have some natural ordering to them, like low, medium, high. Um, age group is another one. And um, regardless of what type of response you have, typically um, we want to be able to relate responses to exposures and covariates that we're interested in via modeling. So why do we want to adjust for covariates? Well, one of the reasons is because typically you want to measure the relationship between an outcome and some exposure of interest. And when doing when modeling that relationship, you might want to account for other covariates that influence the relationship that are confounders or things that interact with the main effect of interest. Um, these are called effect modifiers, or you might want to find some things that are in the causal pathway between the outcome and the exposure of interest. And all of these you can do via modeling. And so from last semester, if you took 6611, you should be familiar with the linear regression model. And so we'll start with that there. And the linear regression model um, looks like this. Uh, you have yi equals xit, the t stands for transpose, um, times beta plus some epsilon i, which are your error terms. Uh, and we're going to look at this in the context of an example um, where the outcome is serum cholesterol levels, and we want to see how age and BMI influence that outcome. So let's look one by one at each of these model components. Yi is the outcome value for subject I. In this case, it's the serum cholesterol value for subject I. Xi bold indicates a vector of covariate values. If Xi is not bold, then it's a scalar number. But in this case, we have Xi1, Xi2, up all the way up to Xip for the number of covariates you have. In this case, since we have two covariates, we'll have a vector of size 2, where Xi1 represents um, the age for the ith individual, and xi2 represents the BMI for the ith individual. Beta is also bolded to represent beta being a vector. Beta are the weights in this model, or the vector of coefficients that link the outcome to the covariates, where beta 0 is the intercept, beta 1 is the coefficient value for age, and beta 2 would be the coefficient value for weight. And finally, epsilon is the error term for the ith subject. And we place some, an assumption on model errors in linear regression that they have a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma squared. So writing this all out, this model, for this specific example, um, and expanding from this matrix notation that we have above, you get um, yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x uh, plus beta 2 times weight plus epsilon. So there are a couple important assumptions of linear regression. Um, and uh, we're going to just briefly review those here. First is there an assumption of independence. This says that the observations yi1, yi2 to yn are independent of each other. The next is the linearity assumption. That's the, the assumption that the relationship between xi and yi is linear. Finally, uh, homostatasticity, that's constant variance assumption, and then normality. We assume 
that the error terms um, in linear regression are normally distributed. And uh, once you have this normality assumption on the errors, then the expected value of your outcome given your covariates is also going to have a normal distribution with mean of the covariates times the coefficients and um, variance sigma squared. So let's look at a brief example using data. And this is the example I mentioned where we're interested in serum cholesterol as the outcome and we wanna see how age and BMI affect it, its covariates in the model. And this data comes from the Dobson package in R. Dobson, the Dobson package has several data sets that are included as examples in this um, Dobson and Barnett book that I referenced earlier. Um, so we're going to be using a couple different data sets from this package. Um, and so looking at right, I've made a histogram of serum cholesterol values in this data. The, the data is continuous, numeric valued. Um, it's, the histogram indicates that it's relatively normal, though it's not perfect. Uh, but it seems like a reasonable candidate for linear regression. So the R code here actually fits that linear model that's shown right here. Um, and basically we're regressing cholesterol level on age and BMI and we get coefficient values that are printed down here. Where the estimate, those are your betas. Uh, so that's a standard, you also get standard error of your betas, which allows you to get confidence intervals around them. Um, T value, because the assumption in linear regression that these are T distributed, these coefficients, and you get a P value as well. And this model estimates the average serum cholesterol level controlling for both age and BMI. So beta hat zero is the intercept. Um, and this is interpreted as the mean cholesterol level for an individual with zero values for all other covariates. So uh, an age of zero and a BMI of zero. In this case, that's pretty much nonsense because uh, no one has an age and BMI of zero. So the intercept is not interpretable in this example. And that is often true when you have multiple linear regression. On the other hand, beta one hat, which hat takes a value of 0 0.041, is interpreted as the mean change in serum cholesterol associated with a one-year age increase while holding BIMI constant. And beta 2 hat is equal to 0 0.201, which is the mean change in cholesterol associated with a one-unit BMI increase holding age constant. So both um, age and BMI contribute to an increase in serum cholesterol level on average. So it's important to check your model when doing linear regression to make sure that the assumptions aren't violated and that the results are reasonable. I'm not going to go through all of the model checking procedures, but just briefly looking at this here, the plot on the left shows a scatter plot of serum cholesterol versus age, and the blue line is a fitted linear regression model um, with cholesterol as the outcome and age as the covariate. And you can see that um, the line fits reasonably well through the data. It seems like a linear relationship between age and serum um, cholesterol level is, is a pretty good fit. Uh, and then on the right-hand side here, we have a plot of the model residuals by age. And really what we're looking for in a plot like this is that the residuals are normally distributed um, around the zero line, which is drawn in red here, and that they are not, um, it's not dependent on a particular age. Like you don't say have way more variance at age 40 than you do at age 50. Um, so those look pretty good. They look like they're pretty normally distributed around zero. So we could say that this is a reasonable model for this data. But what do you do if your outcome isn't continuous and relatively normal? Well, in that case, you might not be able to use linear regression, but let's look at a couple examples of why. So one example that we're gonna be working with a lot is binary responses. Uh, these are responses that can take on a value of zero and one. Uh, here, first consider childhood obesity. 
in this, the outcome is obesity, which takes on why it takes on the value one if the child is obese and zero otherwise. We can consider predictors age or daily uh, hours spent watching TV. Another example, which I'll plot in the next couple slides, is senility in elderly patients. In this case, the response is presence of symptoms of senility, one indicating systems are present, symptoms are present, and zero indicating otherwise. And the predictor of interest is this adult intelligence score. So we're going to look at the example of linear regression with a binary response. In this example, senility, whether you're senile or not, zero or one, is the outcome. And the covariate of interest is this WAIS score. Um, and we might expect, for example, that the WAIS score is lower for more senile subjects. Um, and I'm going to fit this model in R, the data. This data is also coming from the Dobson package. And the second line of code here fits the linear model. This plot shows some of the results of that model fit. On the left-hand side, you have a waste score on the x-axis and um, presence of senility symptoms, where zero indicates you're not senile and one indicates you are uh, on the y-axis. And then the blue regression line that fits this data. And you can see that, yes, as a waste score is higher, you, the subjects tend to be less um, senile. There are fewer ones and more zeros. But the data doesn't, um, the line doesn't fit the data well because there's just not a linear relationship between waste score and uh, presence of senility symptoms because that Y outcome is binary. Uh, similarly, in the plot of the residuals, which is shown at right here, um, these are in no way normally distributed around the zero line. Um, so clearly some of the linear regression assumptions are violated. Which ones? Well, linearity, uh, the outcome and the covariate do not have a linear relationship, as well as normality of the errors and constant variance of the errors. Basically, the only assumptions that's actually met here is the independence assumption. And because of this, linear regression is not a good idea for binary outcomes. You're really not going to get results that you can interpret or trust in a reasonable way. Instead, what you want to use is something called logistic regression, which some of you are probably familiar with and we were, we'll talk about in more detail over the next couple weeks. So what about count responses? Um, count responses are, are values that can take on integers uh, from zero to infinity. An example is melanoma, first example is melanoma where the response would be number of melanoma tumors and certain predictors could be like tumor site, for example, head, your arms, your hands, your feet, and tumor subtype. Another example is heart disease, uh, where the response is count of deaths from coronary heart disease and predictors are age and smoking status. And then an example that we're gonna briefly look at with some data is randomized clinical trial data, where the outcome is the count of positive responses to a vaccine and the predictors are age group, which can take in three different categories, and treatment, which can take three different categories as well. And so I fit a linear regression to this randomized clinical trial example, and um, some plots from that are shown here. On the left-hand side is just a histogram of the outcome. The outcome is definitely not normally distributed based on this histogram. Not only are the values uh, taking on discrete integer um, the outcome takes on discrete interval values, but it's not really that nice bell shape curve that you would expect to see. However, uh, fitting that model and the residuals, which are plotted on the right, show that they are kind of, you know, at least mean zero error does seem to make sense, but they don't, they are not like normally distributed around that zero line. Um, for higher counts, you tend to have residuals that are positive, and for lower counts, you tend to have residuals that are negative, indicating that the constant variance assumption is being violated, as well as the linearity assumption.
So I'm not going to run any more linear models on non-normal data, but I do want to give a couple other examples of data types that we'll see later in this course that we might want to do some kind of regression modeling on, but where a linear regression model won't work. Um, one example is ordered, ordered categorical responses. In this example, you have a university which conducted an investigation on psychology students regarding future job offers. And one of the key questions was whether they expected to find adequate employment after obtaining their degree. So the response can take on three different categories. One being they don't expect to find employment, two being they're not sure, and three is they will obtain employment. And you actually see this type of outcome a lot like in, res in responses that come from surveys. So survey data has a lot of or ordered categorical responses. And in this, we might want to look at the predictor age and years um, and that some act the actual data from this data set is printed below. But one of the issues with modeling this data is that you're going to have some problems that are very similar to the linear regression. You only have um, three different values that outcome can, can take. Um, so doing a linear regression is not going to work. Your linear you know, linearity assumptions as well as other assumptions of linear regression are likely to be violated. So why not use linear regression for these types of data? Well, as you saw, regression assumptions are often violated, um, which leads to nonsensical results. Uh, and sometimes it's not even clear how data like, for example, the ordinal data would fit into a linear regression framework. And then finally, something we haven't talked about is that the range of the outcome and response do not always line up if you don't have normal data. Um, generally, when we do regression, we assume that the betas can take on any value from negative infinity to infinity, even though you usually won't see something in that range. Um, which leads to the linear predictor, which is xi transpose times beta, which also can take on values from negative infinity to infinity. And in linear, linear regressions, we have range consistency for the xi transpose betas and the expectation of yi. And what I mean by that is uh, if you have a normal distribution for your y's, then um, they can take then the expectation of yi can take the range of negative infinity to infinity, just like the xi transpose betas. However, when you have um, other types of outcomes, this isn't necessary to the case. For example, with count outcomes, um, those have to be positive and they're integers, so they're not taking on, they're only taking on values in the range from zero to positive infinity. And binary outcomes, um, the expected value can only be in the range from zero to one. Luckily, we can generalize the normal linear model in a way that allows us to do regression for outcomes that are not normal or ca continuous um, in the response variable. And this is where generalized linear modeling, or GLM, comes in. The generalized part of GLM refers to dropping the normality requirement, relaxing the homoscedasticity assumption, and allowing for some function of expectation of y to be linear in the parameters x beta. And model spe specification for GLMs includes um, specifying the outcome for yi and its distribution, as well as specifying the covariates and how they are related to the mean of the outcome. This is great. It gives us everything we need to fit linear models to discrete non-normal and categorical outcomes. And um, in general, when you talk about GLMs, we focus on outcomes that are coming from exponential family distributions, which include normal, binomial, Poisson, and exponential distributions, and many more. Uh, and we're gonna talk about exponential family distributions and how that uh, fits into the GLM framework in the next lecture. Thanks a lot.